Um, good morning, everybody. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, as you know, we're looking to discuss and examine uh, many things about the shape and the, the nature of the industry that we're all in and how that will evolve in the, in the next few years. Um, our opening panel discussion will examine some of the changes that we might uh, expect to see and some of the things that we might expect to remain constant in the nature of partnerships in this industry. We have to start off by recognizing that partnerships are a tremendously successful business model. Uh, this is a, the largest industry on the planet. It operates largely through joint ventures and is deploying something around a billion, or sorry, a trillion dollars a year into the, uh, into the industry. And, and partnerships are the major vehicle through which that happens. So we start the discussion from a very positive point of view, which is this works. Partnerships work. Um, our role is to think about how some of the changes in those partnerships may affect the future. Uh, to what extent can we expect to see new forms of partnership? Uh, what will the introduction of some new blood, uh, some new players into the global partnership uh, situation and model uh, provide for us? Some new thinking perhaps. Uh, what will happen as the nature of relationships between producers and customers evolve? Uh, will those evolve into stronger partnerships? Will there be new linkages and new opportunities? We've already heard about uh, some of the successful partnerships from the speakers earlier this morning. Um, and this industry has some fantastic examples. 30, 50 years is not uncommon for partnerships to have endured. Um, but like many things that get old, they get difficult. Uh, and when you get old, you start to see new problems and new challenges. So the maturity of partnerships could also be one of the, the things that provokes change. We will discuss some of those thoughts. We'll also think a little bit about technology, uh, access to skills and the mechanisms for sharing the risks that we've, we've heard about so far this morning as being one of the primary uh, drivers to form partnerships in the first place. So I'd like to introduce our, our distinguished panel who are going to help us uh, think our way through the next hour or so uh, in terms of how the industry might evolve and how partnerships may play a role in driving that change. Um, I'll introduce the, the three panellists and then I invite them to come and join me. Um, first we have uh, Mr. Tony Hayward. Uh, Tony is the, uh, the CEO of Ginell Energy um, and will, I'm sure, have, uh, have many interesting views for us as we go. We have Mr. Manuel Ferreira de Oliveira, the Group CEO of Galp Energia. And we have Mr. Jürgen Schulster, the Head of M&A and Upstream Commercial at Vintershaw. Gentlemen, if you'd, uh, if you'd like to join me, please. I think it's fair to say as we, as we start the discussion and as we look around the room uh, today that uh, partnerships have played the pivotal role in building the global oil and gas industry as we know it. Um, so it's a fair assumption that they will play a pivotal role in shaping the industry in the future. Uh, it's not the fact that it's all done. Partnerships exist and there's uh, little work and attention to be paid to keeping them fresh keeping them relevant and keeping them value added. So the objective of thinking about partnerships as, as mechanisms to, to share risk, uh, to combine different skills and assemble the resources needed for some of the kind of projects that we see out there today is, uh, is as relevant today as it's ever been, perhaps even more so. Uh, we heard earlier today some conversation about new challenges to deliver growth, to manage CO2 in the long term. Um, all of these are challenges that will face us uh, and partnerships will be part of those, uh, those solutions. Uh, but first actually, I'm, if I might Tony, I'm going to turn to you and ask a little bit about the nature of partnerships. Um, you've been involved in, in many, um, but more particularly, how do you see them evolving generally um, and specifically with regard to the relationship between producers and customers? Great. Thank you, Peter. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's very good to be here. Um, I think, you know, if you look at the relationship between producers and consumers, of course, it's being fundamentally driven by the very big trends that are occurring in the world, and, and there are two, fundamentally. The first one is the reduction of 
demand in the United States for sources of oil supply from outside the US, which is a consequence of efficiency, reducing the de fundamental demand and the growth of domestic supply. And of course that's being offset by the rise in demand in Asia and particularly in China. Uh, and that is translating into a very different set of relationships emerging between the big producers in the Middle East and their principal consumers. You know, I mean, it's, it's clear that much of the supply that in the last 20 years went westwards is now going eastwards. Uh, and that's reflected in the nature of the political relationships that are emerging between China and Iraq, for example, between China and Saudi Arabia, but also the nature of the participants that are now present and emerging in that part of the world, which still accounts for the, the vast majority of global oil supplies that are traded. And, and you're seeing the emergence of you know, significant, the, the state-owned enterprises of China participating more and more in upstream access in the Middle East. And you know, I, back to my times at BP, when we were looking at the first Iraq license round and thinking about who to partner with, we had an interesting conversation about, you know, do we have a partnership for the 20th century or a partnership for the 21st century? And we ended up partnering with CMPC and, and in, you know, as far as I'm aware, that partnership has been extremely successful in the development of the Romaila oil field in Iraq. So that's an interesting example of how these big trends shape what actually happens on the ground at the asset level. Tony, you mentioned 20th century and 21st century partnerships. Can you elaborate a little bit about what the difference is that what those might well, be? Well, you know, I, I was simply reflecting, and you know, 20 years ago, looking at an opportunity in Iraq, we probably would have thought, well, let's go and partner with Exxon or Shell or someone. And I think, you know, you, you think differently about that sort of opportunity today. And we, you know, we did, and we ended up partnering with the, the biggest Chinese SOE. Thank you, and, and Manuel, the. Uh, the role or the emergence, if you like, of, of new partners onto the scene, maybe uh, these are not necessarily new companies, but playing different roles than they traditionally did. Um, we're here at the NOC Congress, um, and the NOCs are stretching their, their wings, so to speak, and participating much more broadly in the international industry. Um, how do you see the emergence of this new group? Are they going to change the way we think about partnerships? Are they going to be uh, following the, uh, the traditional path or, or, or helping us think about some new options? Thank you, Peter, and good morning to everybody. Uh, let me uh, just uh, 30 seconds to say that I've been in the industry for slightly more than 40 years, and I've worked for IOCs, the big multinationals. I worked for an NOC. And I had the privilege of taking a NOC, a full NOC company, to a full IOC company. So I'm some, uh, some kind of an hybrid, you know. And, and let me tell you that, that uh, presently the company I the, that I run, Galp Energia from Portugal, has uh, m many partnerships, but uh, I would focus on f four. In Brazil with Petrobras, in uh, Angola with Sonangol, and in, in Mozambique with ENH and in the Far East link to Brazil with Sanopec. So these are totally different partnerships because the partner is different and the modeling of the partnership has to be uh, in a way tailored to the type of company we partnered with. My view about this IOC NOC debate is that this is a temporary debate. It will finish in a couple of years, probably by the end of this decade, because we will not, we see the blurring of the two concepts. We see uh, the NOCs becoming more and more, now we are already named them, INOCs, I then the N will be dropped, and then we'll have just oil and gas companies. With, um, and that uh, will be at, we'll move to that stage in in, at different speeds depending on, on, on the stage of development of the NOC. So what do I see on emerging NOCs? Emerging NOCs, the symbol of that, uh, of that is the one that is 
partner in, our strategic partner in Mozambique, which is ENH. It's a young company with tremendous human energy, with the willing to learn and, and grow, uh, but facing the challenges of basically being, a, in global terms, a startup. Um, the relationship with a company of this nature is totally different than the relationship with Petrobras, for instance, or uh, Sinopec, or even Son and Gold. And we have successfully tr contributed to the success of ENH. And our, our ba basic principle is how can we make a win-win relationship? Um, what can we give? And what can we get so that the debt marriage is is a long-term marriage? Both have to win, and uh, obviously, this on a case-by-case -case basis has to win to be discussed. That's, I think, a short a short answer. And, and Manuel, those are, are very different relations, as you say. The companies you're partnering with are at very different stages of evolution uh, in their own countries, but also in the relationships with uh, with you and other yeah. oil and gas companies what are some of the differences in what are some of the adaptations you've had to make to uh, to the way you work to, to work with these these kinds of different players you see the the, the partnerships uh, their shape is a lot related with its origin like let's take uh, Sonangol. we have been involved in the birth of Sonangol in the in the 60s so our company effectively was active in Angola while we our company was was there operating then Angola became an independent country Sonangol has been a tremendously success uh, NOC it it still has a lot of future ahead our relationship is of one nature in ENH our relationship is trying to see tell them what can we do for you to succeed? That's a kind because we clearly understand the tremendous responsibility that that small company has in the years ahead, particularly in this in the forthcoming decade. So we basically are answering to to their to their requests. So because helping or cooperating is not doing what we want to do, is doing what the other party expects us to do. And understanding the difference is, is of extreme importance. Um, the relationship with Petrobras, we've been in Brazil since the opening of the markets in Brazil, uh, and uh, the relationship is based on, on across the different levels of management in terms of personal engagement and uh, knowledge sharing. And that is, I think, a very, and then business would come out of it. Uh, with Sinopec is a, is a, is a slightly more recent uh, relationship that we started up in Brazil. Uh, and we, uh, what we are trying to do is making sure that um, uh, we had basically, when we set up a partnership of that nature, we have a business plan, we have objectives, and what I can actually share with everybody is, is that our target is always to uh, do more than uh, do more than we contracted, do more than what we agreed, so that that so that success uh, brings further success. And uh, if we succeed in one project, and the parties are happy, both because of uh, the reliable and transparent relationships, and uh, each one giving what it has to give, then uh, you go to another step. You go to another step of partnership. So it's a it's kind of going up uh, 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 journey. Thank you. So the, the different situations and different circumstances, and Tony, if I just might ask you a little on the difference between dealing in partnerships with new companies, companies that have uh, a heritage of, of decades, uh, is, is that a different kind of setup or are there, di there are similar kind of principles behind partnerships with old and new players? I, I honestly think the principles are the same. Uh, you know, you, the, both parties need to see they can get something out of being in the partnership. Uh, and it, it you know, from my perspective, it, it varies on a sort of case-by-case -case basis, but you do need to be clear what both parties bring and ensure that in the years following this establishment that both parties are contributing in the way that was envisaged when the thing was established. And, and Jürgen, establishing a venture and, and thinking about the lifetime of a venture, these are 
not just the time scale of, uh, of oil and gas projects, but they run through the life cycle of an entire industry, potentially, uh, in a country. And, you know, 30 years is not uncommon. 50 years, we've heard uh, already today, is uh, also possible for these things. How do you see the, uh, the health and vitality of a partnership? How do you retain that long term? Vintershal has been uh, busy in many places around the world, but has long term enduring partnerships. What are, the, what are the recipes as we look forward for continuation of successful long term partnerships? Uh, thank you, Peter, and uh, good morning. Um, Wintersal, really the nature of Wintersal is partnerships and as a relatively small uh, mid-sized company with about 400,000 barrels of uh, daily production, we do love growth and what enabled the growth in the past have, have been partnerships and certainly that is also true uh, for the future. And I would think it's uh, three themes uh, that are important and that is one, you have to focus. Yeah, we, we are focusing on core regions which means where we are, and that's the second point, we go into local partnerships. We want to be amongst the best where we operate. And thirdly, um, a partnership is all about sharing uh, the risks and the benefits um, of your ventures. And as an example, I can uh, offer transformation also. We have a long established partnership uh, with Gazprom, which started right in the 90s, um, on the downstream side. And with time, we moved more to the upstream side. Uh, we, we did some um, swap deals um, to move into participations, into joint ventures. We worked on that. And just recently, we focused much more on the upstream side because it's our strategy to go closer to the source. And so there's two or three points that would make uh, transitions in partnerships. And it, the basis for it is it's, it's trust. And like you said uh, in your first statement, partnerships do work and they do work very well for us. So one thing can be a change in strategy for one of the partners, which then the other partners, uh, the, the partner would also um, have to support and that work very, very well with Gazprom. And do you think, Jürgen, you, you, we heard earlier again this morning uh, several references to having to think long term in this industry. Do you think partnerships are able to think long term or do they get over, you know, very excited about uh, uh, getting formed and, and investing and, and, and moving step by step, or are they really thinking long term? I think partnerships are uh, all about long term. Even the notion of partnership already means that you have had gone through a, a transition where you have become partner, else you don't have the partnership. So there's always a phase before you then would really consider yourselves as partners. And long term is, a, is an essential part of, uh, of any partnership. Because only if you plan for the long term, you can establish the trust where it can be, become really a fruitful uh, relation. And, and Manuel, you, uh, as you mentioned, I hope you won't mind me uh, going back to it, but you've been uh, observing the industry and participating in it for a long time. You've seen uh, successful partnerships. Um, if in your experience, where do partnerships run into difficulty? If we're thinking now out to the next generation of partnerships, the 21st century partnerships that Tony alluded to, um, what do they have to watch out for? You see, at the end of the, at the, end of the road, diversity exists you know, in human life and exists in corporate life. You know? If a partnership is not going well, the best way is, is, is divorcing. You know? Maintaining an um, a, um, a unsatisfactory partnership is, is a pain on the back. You know? It consumes a lot of time and uh, destroys a lot of value. So I only consider successful partnerships. Uh, what I would say is that uh, when I looking back, uh, I I could understand the need the need for the for partnerships, uh, say, 10, 15 years ago, uh, as uh, uh, because. In, at least in the early stage of my professional life, technology was technology and know-how was uh, enshrined in the international IOCs, the large international IOCs. Uh, then, with the crisis of the 90s or so, the outsourcing of uh, of um, of uh, even research and development and technology made the knowledge accessible to every player of the industry. So today. Uh, it is not. Uh, it is. Uh, it is appropriate to say 
that any NOCs, if it has good management, if it is able to recruit good people and they can compete in the world market for good people, they can have access to knowledge and technology. So it's a question of time uh, where the, the DNA of a, uh, of a NOC uh, gets very close to a, the DNA of a traditional IOC. Um, and uh, in that sense, the difference, the difference will, will, will disappear, particularly for the large, uh, large uh, IOCs, uh, NOCs. So what do I say about, about the, the future? The future is this one, it's converging. The past is that I understood the difference. And that's it. Thank you. And, and Tony, when you think about the long term for partnerships, what, what, what is long term? How, how long is long? Well, I think anyone in this industry, whenever they create something, is always thinking in at least a decade, and often many decades. Uh, and most partnerships falter primarily for two reasons. That there is strategic misalignment occurs between the two participants, and I, I think, you know, I was instrumental in creating and sort of managing and, in some senses, overseeing the demise of a very big partnership in the industry, which is one between TNK and BP. Which, where you know, when the thing was set up, there was strong strategic alignment. It was clear what both sides were bringing, and as um, ten years on, there was very significant strategic misalignment. Well, the one side wanted to do one thing, and the other side wanted to do another thing, and it was right that the two entities should part part company. The, the other re reason when partnerships fail is because what one of the parties is not sort of keep pulling their weight, they're not delivering on their side of the bargain. Um, that, that in my experience is actually less common. It's normally the strategic misalignment that causes uh, partnerships uh, to fail. Uh, and I, I just absolutely agree with Manuel about the way in which the industry is evolving. Uh, and I'd also observe that to build the broad-based know-how and capability that the IOCs have today, with it, it takes time. So it will take another couple of decades, in my view, to create the same sort of capability amongst the emerging NOCs as exists within the IOCs today. And that's simply because of their long legacy of geographic spread in many, many different hydrocarbon provinces. Most NOCs start life in one or two, and it just takes time to build expertise and capability and know-how across a broad spread. But, but the trends are very clear. And, and just picking up on those trends, Jürgen, in the partnership model we've been discussing, we're largely discussing IOCs, NOCs, and traditional oil companies working together. Um, but today, obviously, we have the services sector playing uh, an increasing role and, and maybe a role that can accelerate some of the evolution that you described, Tony. Um, but Jürgen, is, is there a role for three different kinds of players in partnerships? Do we need a new name for that? It's not just a partnership, it's a, something else? Um, I don't know if we need a new name for it, but I, I totally agree with Manuel that there will be the transition, and it has been said uh, before today, for most NOCs uh, to become much more aggressive players uh, outside of their uh, home countries in the, on the international arena. And so the challenge will be to, and I think there's also room for that in the future, to find a niche that is still interesting for, uh, for partnering. I mean, there's the obvious reason that, that will not go away in our industry, that is partnering in order to uh, share the risk and increase your portfolio. With the same money, you can uh, participate rather in three ventures than only in one with 100%. So NOCs might be a likely partner, like have been IOCs before. I think that's what Tony refers to, that 20 years ago maybe an Exxon would have been a, a partner of choice. And that, that uh, changes certainly in the future. So that's one uh, uh, transition that we probably will see more in the next decades to come. And the other is that uh, some IOCs uh, like us still have uh, unique features that might be interesting for other partners. As we have uh, our principal shareholder is a chemical company, there's lots of synergies that can be taken there. For example, we develop a biopolymer, just as one example, uh, that can be used in EOR measures uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. So there's a unique feature where you need an IOC to, to bring in, um, let's say, ideas like, like that into, into a partnership. And that will be 
uh, I think, interesting for NOCs and IOCs as well. Should I just add something? I think one of the interesting things to look at as you look at the evolution and emergence of NOCs is to look at the evolution of their shareholding structure and the governance to which they're subjected to. And, you know, it's a fact that whilst a government is the principal shareholder and it's not a broadly distributed shareholder base, the likelihood of them being able to compete in the same basis as an IOC on the one hand is enhanced possibly because of government to government relationships but on another hand is is disadvantaged because the commercial drivers that drive an IOC are not necessarily the same things that drive an NOC which has a very significant government controlling stake and you see that in many there's many good examples of that yeah. Can I can I add something by experience? No. Galp Energy, which is a Portuguese oil and gas company, uh, 15, 15 years ago was totally owned by the government. Today it's totally private. I had the privilege of, of leading that journey. The company today has nothing to do in terms of culture and attitude and, uh, and actual responsibility uh, uh, when compared with the company. I, I took over in the in the in the in the early 90s, so it's uh, and that's 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 unavoidable. But what we see is that ONOCs are now getting becoming floated. Most likely, the mo the most internationalised would the governments will d decrease their position as their exposure to the capital markets increase, their responsibility changes, and that will change the culture. And just for a moment to try and put ourselves in the shoes of these uh, national companies who are investing outside of their home base. Um, I think each of you have experience of, of long-standing ventures um, in, if I might, natural places for your companies to invest. I mean, Galp being in Mozambique and Angola is not an accident, I would presume. Uh, there's a good reason for that. Vintershoals heritage uh, links you with Gazprom and uh, those sort of things. But what's, what's it like uh, trying to go to a new place? And Tony, you've, you've gone to many new places. Um, how does that feel as compared to extending partnerships in, in traditionally strong places? I'll come to each of you. Well, I think whenever you go to a new place, I mean, you know, certainly in, the, in this industry, one of the first things you think about is um, what vehicle, I, I, which, what partnership are you going to uh, establish and and you can you know you can create partnerships for different reasons. Uh, you can create partnerships to give you some form of competitive advantage, be it technology or the availability of capital, access to a low cost supply chain. You can create partnerships actually to take out the competition. I mean, and that that's not uh, uncommon in in upstream access to partner with people who you know are going to be very competitive as a way of reducing the, the competitive playing field. So I think, I mean, you know, m mainly people will think about the specifics of the country or region, province that they're entering and I think try and figure out what is the way to give themselves the greatest competitive advantage. Like it may be geopolitical, it may be technical capability, or, or you know, it's rarely going to be capital in today's world. Capital is freely available. It, it might be um, to do with changing the competitive dynamic. But do you do, do something distinctively different when you go to a new place versus extending uh, uh, relations in an existing? I think generally that that's the case. I mean, you know, there are some partnerships that have um, been global. I mean, at BP going back a long time now, created a global um, partnership with Statoil, which was an interesting example of a partnership that didn't work, actually. You know, the deal was, um, it was pretty straight, straightforward. We, would, we had created an enormous global exploration portfolio. We needed someone to help us come and share the risk, and that we saw the opportunity to create a relationship with Statoil that over time would give us access to a greater share of Norway and a bigger bigger position in Norway through Statoil. Uh, we delivered on our side of the deal and frankly the other side of the deal didn't deliver so in the mid-90s we dissolved that partnership. I mean it, it went from you know it start we started it in early 90s and by the back end of the 90s 99 it was clear that there wasn't a quid pro quo so it was dissolved. And Not very many 
in my experience, not very many partnerships are able to go across the globe. In, in, um, you know, there are some examples in this industry, but they're relatively few. Yeah, they need to be specific. Yeah. And Jürgen, how about you in, in Vintischal, the, the difference between a new partnership and a, a mature, shall we say, or existing, is there something that you do differently, some criteria that you, you focus on, or how do, how do you think about that? It's totally different aspects uh, of partnership uh, when you compare an established one to, to a new um, partnership. And I think part of our success is also um, when we enter a new region, we don't pick the partner up front. Um, we now established um, operations in the Middle East, for example, and we, we do that on a slow ramp up. Uh, we build an, uh, we had an office, a re pure representative office, for about two years, and out of that, um, we, we started negotiations on a sour gas field uh, called Shubai Hat. And we successfully concluded a contract on that. And now we start building up an organization that is able to operate. And in parallel, we, we have all these contacts uh, to all local players, to international players. OMV, for example, there is a partner. And, but we have not picked a partner or a principal partner for the, for the region. And that will come uh, with time. It's not that we go ahead and say, okay, we pick up that partner up front and then uh, we try to stick for it for a decade or so and it turns out it doesn't work. We'd rather go there for half a decade and pick the right, uh, right partner while we're already there and see uh, that we have the same strategy, the, the same targets. Uh, and Jürgen, is that a model that you'd recommend to NOCs around the room who are looking at new regions? Is that how they should be thinking about it? Planting seeds and then uh, managing their way through the opportunities? It, de it definitely works for us. I, uh, um, I don't know if that would work for, for every entity. There's quite different entities uh, all around. I think that's also an uh, important aspect. One NOC is not like another NOC anymore, like there's not one IOC like another IOC anymore. It's not really that uh, black and white. There's lots of shades of grey uh, in between. So, Manuel, the same question in terms of uh, new versus old uh, partnerships and relationships. Uh, again, maybe you can look at it from an NOC perspective as well, but uh, do, do they differ? Are they the same for you or do you take a different approach? Two points. One is that no company being IOC or, or, or NOC or whatever can, th can act locally. I think we all, so all the NOCs will we, we have to get out of their comfortable zone. Otherwise, they cannot uh, succeed long term. So, first point that I would like every company, I'm, I'm saying what is obvious, every company in our business has to think globally, think, and act in regions where it feels uh, comfortable. Uh, uh, so, if, we, if any company wants to move, Obviously, culture is, has no relation with culture and the, and the geology. So the driving force of moving to another place is driven by nature, by geology. But if we can conciliate that with culture, if you move to an area that is geologically attractive, but in which there is, uh, there is uh, a similar culture, in, w in places in where you feel at home, that is the good combination for, for a corporation to move uh, internationally. Our company, which is today a, in the sector, is, is a mid-sized company. Uh, we operate in 15 countries, but obviously uh, for the anchor of our future and our present are the Portuguese-speaking countries, where we feel at home. Uh, obviously, when I'm in Luanda, I do not differentiate the bureaucracy, the attitude of the people, is not just the language, it's the way we act. Both in, Moza in Brazil, I feel exactly like in Portugal. In Mozambique, the same thing. So, and fortunately, these are three jewels of nature in terms of geology. So if you can conciliate these things, is, is the best of the best. Otherwise, we have to compromise. But the first driving force is geology. The second, I would say, uh, is culture. And relationship. Find a place you can exist and enjoy. Yeah, that's coming. Um, I'm going to turn to the audience for questions in a minute, but just before I, I do that, I just wanted to warn you, I'd like to hear some questions from uh, NOC 
representatives around the room um, thinking about the gentlemen here and how they can help us uh, think about the new partnerships for the future. So we'll come to you in a minute, but particularly please NOC um, representatives in the room, if you could be scribbling questions uh, right now, that will be very helpful. Um, we're looking for uh, some, some good points to be made uh, from you and then we'll open the floor more generally. But before before I do that, I think um, some of the areas that we've, uh, we've touched on uh, in the past uh, about the shape and nature of, of partnerships, uh, I'd like to kind of get a little bit more specific. I'd like to get a little bit more uh, down into the detail of, of what works, what doesn't work. Um, and there are two, two parts to that uh, question. One is around technology and the role of NOCs, IOCs and service companies. And the other one is about the element of risk sharing and uh, the mechanisms that actually foster effective partnerships. Um, a lot of them do get stuck uh, in their formative stages on commercial uh, terms. They get stuck on uh, rights and obligations of the parties and so forth. Um, but let me start on the, on the technology note and, and Manuel, uh, come back to you a little bit uh, there and then again I'll ask Tony and Jürgen to comment. Um, what role technology today? Is this the role of the service company now or how, how does technology come into a partnership? <coughs> See, the, the company I work for uh, is a vertically integrated company but the comment I'm going to make is fundamentally addressed to the ENP division of the company. Uh, when I think I get distant from my daily job, I compare the ENP business with the pharmaceutical industry long term, a lot of trials, only some succeed, science and technology. Uh, so, so effectively, uh, our industry, uh, uh, will, the players of the industry that uh, will succeed are those that first need to apply, apply the best available technologies for everything they do. But in order to apply the best available technologies, they have to have knowledge, and they have to participate, to apply them well, they have to participate in their development. So the, you can see that the uh, budgets of the research and, uh, and development departments of the large corporations, and I've made the, I, I, I know the number that last year, the 10 largest corporations of the sector invested approximately 10 billion euros in research and development. And, uh, and you see that ranking, uh, more than 50% are NOCs. So you can see that uh, is, is the way forward, is participating in the development of technology. The development of, of technology by definition is, um, is, um, is a joint work with uh, basic science, public research and development institutes and, uh, and also private development institutions and, uh, and in-house development. So if you don't participate in the development you can, of technology, you cannot apply that technology well. And specifically, uh, what kind of technology are you thinking about? In our sector, I, I subscribe fully uh, what has been said in the previous uh, debate, that the key issues are enhanced oil recovery, or if I would prefer to use the, the word reservoir management, which is a continuously evolving technology. Nothing to do when what have, how we the, how we manage reservoirs today, and how we did uh, 30 or 40 years ago, and uh, and uh, that's one. And another one, another one is is uh, is safety and uh, safety operations to ensure that we do not face uh, uh, human lives loss because our industry we play with fire. Uh, we play with fuels, you know, and uh, high pressures, high temperatures, and, and these things kill. I, had, uh, I went to the funerals of several of my colleagues throughout my professional life. So it's not a easy, uh, so it's safety, safety, and uh, environmental, uh, environmental performance. So it's techno these are the key pillars of, uh, of what we have to do. Reservoir management, safety, and environment. Obviously, we have to uh, is engineering development of the different plants, reduce all the things that. But that's an, a more conventional um, technological development, building uh, different drilling, drilling, drilling technologies. For, for every component of the value chain, there is a lot of work to continuously evolve. And the industry, 
in 10, 20 years will be, in tech, from the technological point of view, totally different as it is today. We do not see in our industry big technological discontinuities. They, they start up slowly, but then they explode in, in, in applications and, uh, and with major impact on, on, on the business. And, and Jürgen, if I can turn to you on uh, Vintashola, a technology deep company, if I could call it that. Um, how do you see that playing out? What, what kind of areas do you emphasize? How do you bring those into partnerships? Um, uh, when it comes to service companies, I still think, let's say, the standard technologies you, they can provide, but the ideas um, and the innovation that still has to come from the oil companies. And that in the future certainly is much more the NOCs also as well as the IOCs. As for us, uh, we really have to play a niche. So in the reservoir management uh, EOR, we still have to focus on certain areas. Um, and we do have operations um, where we also, what we have seen uh, from, from Chevron uh, is quite an impressive example, um, operations where we can increase through steam flooding um, the recovery factors from 20, uh, the example was 10, in our case it was about 20, 25 percent, up to 60, 70 percent. And that is where we are really good in. So the strength is then to find other areas where, where we can use that niche technology. So in that respect we are a very technology driven company, but we can't do everything, we can't cover all fields of technology. And I think no company today really can, can claim to be able to do that. Okay. And Tony, in, in your, your company, how do, how do you access technology and bring it into to partnerships? What's the model that works for you? The industry is an industry, industry, in, interesting industry when it comes to technology. I, I would draw a big distinction between technology and know-how. Technology is available to most participants in the industry very soon after it's been created. Technology is disseminated very quickly in the industry, partly because of the joint venture partnerships that we've been talking about. But the thing that is that makes the real difference, though, is the know-how, and that's created through doing whatever it is you're doing with the technology time and time and time again. And that's, that is what creates real distinction. You know, if you have the opportunity to practice and practice and practice, uh, and it doesn't matter whether you're sitting in an NOC or an IOC, it's the application of the technology and the practice of using the technology to enhance all recovery, improve seismic imaging, drill better subsort wells, but it, it is the doing and the application of technology that is the both the differentiator and the enabler in the industry and it's not really about a piece of technology because everyone can pretty well access all of the technology. I mean, you know, my needle company I have today, which is a million miles away from BP, accesses pretty well all the technology that was available to BP. The difference is we don't have Prudhoe Bay to practice on, we don't have the deep water Gulf of Mexico to practice on, we don't have the 25 other big portfolio positions that BP has, we just have a few. But it's the same stuff. But it's the same stuff. The same stuff. Right, I'm going to, I'm going to come back uh, and just ask the, the guys about um, risk sharing and that, but I'm just going to remind the NOC uh, folks in the room that we're going to come to you next uh, on questions, and I know who some of you are, so be careful. Uh, there's a, an, un, uh, an, an un, unclear step in the uh, formation of a partnership, and all of the, the good words that we've had, heard said about the... Uh, how well they work and how nice it is to work in collaboration and how uh, warm the uh, relations are between the various parties. It's about money, right? It's about sharing risk and making a good investment, right? In the partnerships of the future, uh, do we need to do anything different? Um, we've heard about CO2 coming into the mix. We've certainly heading into uh, less well-known types of situations, upstream and downstream into markets. Um, what are the new financial, fiscal frameworks that we need to be thinking about? What are the new elements that will come into play? Is it, you know, every, we've heard this morning as well from the speaker, uh, oil and gas is here for a long time, so pricing is going to stay pretty good, right? The outlook is, uh, is favorable for pricing. Um, Jürgen, what, what, do you, what do you think? What are the elements that are going to be the, uh, the drivers of the new fiscal frameworks of the future? 
Oh, uh, when it comes uh, to the framework conditions, I think it goes beyond even only the, the fiscal uh, regime. It's um, what we face in our home turf in, in Germany now. Um, we had a discussion if there's a lot of potential um, for shale gas um, slash uh, shale oil in, in that region. And we are hampered even to find out if there's any potential because there's such a public opinion against uh, what is called fracking um, that since uh, two years uh, no well was fracked in Germany. And it's a technology that is not new. We uh, apply it since 50 years. And then the public discussion, it's totally mixed up between um, fracking conventional or tight gas wells and fracking shales uh, in, in shallow depth. And in a way, it's a strange discussion. On the other hand, I think also as an industry, we have failed in a way to um, transport the, me the message um, what, what we are doing and why we are doing it. I saw, uh, just as an example, that uh, astonishes me, we, on a bumper sticker, um, there's a, I saw a sign just a couple of days ago in Germany, no fracking in Germany. It was on a car. And pe people <laughs> like cars, but they don't like the fuel. Uh, so it's, I think, uh, how we can in the future handle um, and transparency that was uh, discussed this morning certainly is a part of it, but I think we have to go uh, beyond that. Um, in order to make a little bit clearer what our industry wants and what we can deliver to society. And the fiscal system then, of course, is part of the, of the government's responsibility to, to enable that and to be able to get those resources out of the ground. Can, can I just make an observation yeah. on that, which I think is, you know, one of the biggest enablers of shale gas in the United States was who owned the mineral rights. And the mineral rights were owned by the people on whose land uh, the wells were being drilled. Uh, and I, th I, I genuinely believe that if Europe in particular is going to see any material shale gas volume created in the gas markets of Europe, the structure of who owns the rent has to change. Uh, and individuals, through some mechanism, need to see the benefit of having a drilling rig parked in their back garden. If, if it, and it's, it's quite dramatic in the United States. On federal lands, there's been almost no activity. On state lands, reasonable amount of activity. On privately owned lands, it's been extensively drilled up. And, uh, you know, in, in this country, we are in a debate about how we can give real monetary benefits to those who would, you know, be inconvenienced by having drilling rigs in their backyards. Uh, and, you know, I, th I think that's been a ma it was a massive enabler in the US, and, and without something similar, it's not going to happen in Europe. So releasing the potential by figuring out who's got some say in the matter. Manuel, what, what about you? In terms of the fiscal world out there, you're in some places in, in the early stages of development and in the mature areas as well. What kind of fiscal pressures will we see in the future? See, what governments do in every country, if you are a member of a government, is to maximize uh, revenue to run their, their, their country. So, it's, so first of all, we have to understand that. Second, if they push, push it too hard, then they stop investment. So it's, uh, and that would be, would be always a, a point of equilibrium to be achieved. And um, as, uh, so the rent, let us call it that way, the, the return on the capital employed uh, would, be, would be, in a way, shared in a fair manner. Uh, probably through transient periods where unfairness exists. Uh, the production sharing agreements that have been actually developed and applied all over the world are one instrument that uh, supports that. Um, the concession contracts are totally different because they typically are the front-end payment in terms of rights of the concession. So in our experience is that uh, for high-risk exploration, concessions are, are a best bet because they can attract, um, uh, attract uh, uh, companies uh, willing to take high risk and then have high returns if they succeed. 
for more mature basins, for where the, the, the probability of success is much higher, risk is lower, is production sharing agreements. I think these two combinations will coexist. Brazil is now where we uh, have uh, operations, uh, is now having the two models of fiscal regimes, totally different, apl applicable to two different levels of risks to be taken. But on the complementary, something that was said before, I want to fully support what, uh, what Tony just said on the application of technology. Sorry to go back to that point. Because if, and that is one extreme value of partnerships. Our small company has participated to date since we returned to exploration and production in the late 90s, because we had activity before that was nationalized by the host countries. We, we have participated in the drilling of 275 deep and ultra deep well, offshore wells. Uh, it's, that's only possible uh, because we have many partnerships. Uh, and uh, by being an active member of those partnerships, we capture the experience and knowledge. And so now today, Partnerships bring opportunities to mid-sized companies and to NOCs to gain exp to have access to the experience that used to be a kind of, I would not say monopoly, but a kind of privilege of the large corporations. So through partnerships will bring that experience, but you have to be an active partner, not just a, an observer a partner. Thank you. Uh, so talking of active partners, can we put the lights on uh, in the room? and wake up the audience before we've got lunch coming pretty soon but uh, as I mentioned before what I'd like uh, if we might to start off with is uh, some of the NOC representatives in the room um, questions yeah can we get a mic have we got a microphone there's one at the front and oh, okay to start here or? no it's just here right at the front mm -hmm. sorry for that I think we're down to one mic for the audience. It's going to be a great question. <laughs> Good luck. Can you just explain who you are and then uh, the question, please? Yeah, my name is Rauf from Mari Petroleum, Pakistan. Uh, it's a Pakistani company and uh, very successful in Pakistan. And uh, now we are planning to go outside and uh, do some partnership with other companies. So my question is, uh, as we have some experience here, uh, becoming NOCs, NOCs becoming INOCs successfully from last decades, what are the uh, big challenges that a company going outside has to face initially short term and long term for this venture? Jürgen, would you like to have a, a first stab at that? Um, it, it's a whole set of uh, challenges. Um, I think the, the main challenge would be rather focused on the area you go to rather than that you go out of a certain area. Um, so definitely a thorough analysis is needed and I, I totally agree here. It's the rocks. That's where it has to start. It has to be a, a prolific basin. Um, that, that's where you can be successful. And that, that is the definite uh, first step. And then the second step would be all um, uh, the framework conditions, pot potential partners, potential competition um, uh, to look at. So that, that would be, I think, the, the two main, uh, main aspects to start with. And Tony, any, any advice uh, how to step out into a, a new set of activities beyond, uh, beyond traditional activities, right? You're a very well-established domestic company. Are you an EMP company, or a, I, I, sorry, I don't know. It's, it's an EMP company, is it? Yeah. yeah. So you know, I think as a, as a small EMP company, you know, because which is what I now am, or my little company, you've really got there are two choices really. You you can either go to the political frontier, or you can go to the technical frontier. You, what you what you can't do is go and compete in places where all the big guys are, because it, you know it's very tough to be successful. So you know. When Manuel went to Brazil, it was the technical frontier. They created a great position. With Ganel, we've gone to two political frontiers. We went to Kurdistan. There, aren't many, there weren't many people there when we went because people considered it to be politically too risky. And recently, we've gone to Somaliland. Same reason, politically too risky. 
or we've gone to the technical frontier. By that I mean places where we believe that there's the opportunity to find material oil and gas, but most of the industry has not yet got there. And both Manuel and I are, I've recently gone to Morocco, where the industry had not been for a long time, and we think you know the, the success of West Africa may well continue north into Morocco. So I think you've got to find places as a small company where you can have the opportunity to have some competitive advantage. What, what, what you will not be very successful doing, I don't think, is going to places where all the big guys are and, you know, it's... So it's thinking about, you know, where's the, where, where are the edges? Where's the frontiers? Where are the frontiers politically? Where are the frontiers technically? Thank you very much. There's a question right at the back. Hello, my, my name is Tim Powell with PLS Inc. I uh, want to direct a question towards Tony. You mentioned the development of the shale uh, community in Europe and you compared it to the US. Uh, I completely agree with the landscape of having uh, individuals own the rights in the ground. Now, you referenced having some sort of mechanism, you were general, probably for a reason, on how that transition would happen in Europe, if possible. Do you have any ideas? Um, I, I think there's some incentives for the industry to do that, uh, for development. However, there may not be for the government, because um, the government is getting the take. If there is long-term benefits for the government, i.e. Uh, employment opportunities and, and growth in GDP, that could be, uh, I don't know, decades away. Um, I don't know if politically that's in the best need of, of who's in, in the running for the government right now. And then kind of a second part of the question, in developing countries, uh, i.e. Africa, do you see that type of system being effective, or do you need the structure of government and licensing grounds to develop these new plays versus uh, worrying about lack of in infrastructure and, and corruption, uh, having it at the, at the ground level with individuals? Thanks. Okay. Um, I, I think in the, in the matter of you know, Europe and shale gas, I, I genuinely feel there's an opportunity for the government, as it were, to surrender some of the rent that they would otherwise enjoy to the people who are more, most directly impacted by the activity. Um, that debate has begun in the UK. There's a debate going on about how can we in some way compensate people who are going to be impacted by the activity. I, I, you know, I don't think it's a big... You know, if you think about the US, you know, the royalty rate 10, 12 percent, it's not an enormous share of the pie, but for the, to an individual and the community, it of course has an enormous impact, which is why there has been, you know, so many people are so keen to have the fracking industry turn up wherever they are in the US. Um, I, I think in the, uh, in the, most of the emerging parts of the world where shale gas looks like it can have real impact, they're not struggling with the same issue of, you know, dense, dense population. So I think it's less of an issue. I would imagine that in most of those places it will be relatively easy to have what the industry would think of as conventional fiscal terms applied to them, be it, be it you know, tax and revenue or, or a, sorry, tax and royalty or a, um, or a PSC. Thank you very much. We've got time for maybe two more questions uh, over here. Uh, Keith, Keith Martin, uh, PetroChina. Uh, so we've talked a lot about growth around the world, different parts, South America, uh, Asia, Russia. What about Europe? If you could invest in Europe, where would you invest? Manuel, would you want to have a go at that? Investing in Europe. Investing in Europe, it's a good thing, by the way. You see, we are spending at least a lot of money, whether it is investment or not, we'll see, in, uh, in basic, based on the theory of the conjugate margins, in deep of, ultra deep offshore Portugal, we are investing. And by the way, we invited Petrobras to be our partners in, in that exploration exercise, making bilateral uh, uh, agreements. Um, and um, and that is so 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 uh, what happens is that on the conventional uh, oil and gas industry uh, uh, the geology of Europe is well known so apart from the Atlantic uh, frontier and some in the med most of Europe has been fully explored but on non-conventional I subscribe every word um, that uh, that uh, Tony uh, uh, referred to Probably not everybody knows that in the USA even there are one 
own, there are owners of the land, and when you own a land, you own a land up to a, you can lease uh, the rights of the land up to a certain depth. So you've got one piece of land that has three owners, one for the first 1,000 meters, another for the next 1,000. So it's, it's quite a sophisticated process that, um, that has been developed throughout uh, years and years, and that facilitates the tremendous development they have. Europe has to find a solution for that. And then quickly then, Jürgen, where would you invest in Europe? And finally, Tony. Oh, yeah, we, do, we definitely uh, still invest a lot uh, in, in Europe, and it's of course more uh, on the conventional side. And there are surprises. I mean, we, we do invest a lot um, in, in Norway, where we had uh, some good discoveries uh, in 2012. And the surprise was in the Netherlands, which is really a mature basin, I totally agree. The geology is mostly known, but there in the Cretaceous, uh, we had an oil find. Um, that surprised everybody. Uh, yeah. That, that there are still so, so potentially large fields. We are still in the appraisal phase, um, in the middle of a very mature basin. And, and Tony? Uh, well, I think the, my two colleagues have said it all in terms of the upstream sector. You, you obviously invest where you think you might find big oil and gas, and there aren't too many uh, places in Europe left uh, for that. And maybe if uh, the legislation is ever put in place in, into unconventionals. I, I think downstream, I, I wouldn't invest in Europe today. Uh, I think uh, that Europe is going to be consigned to very low growth rates for a very long time, and we will be faced with surplus capacity in most sectors of the downstream energy petrochemical space for decades to come, probably. And, and let me add to that, I think in Europe especially, and also where we are sitting now uh, in the UK, the fiscal terms, if, we, if Europe wants to get the full potential from conventional to unconventional, uh, something's got to change in the future. Well, with that, I think uh, we have to wrap up because it's probably lunchtime. You'll be pleased to know. Um, join me, uh, if you would, in thanking uh, Jürgen, Miguel, and Tony.